Well, welcome everybody to my talk inside the mind of a graphic recorder. Um, I was telling Denise before I popped on here that I'm really used to being concise. So I was like, oh no, why did I sign up for a 60 minute time slot? And uh, so we're just going to see how the next little while goes. I, I did really want to leave time at the end for questions uh, anyways. So I, I likely won't be taking the whole 60 minutes um, because I do, I always find uh, people have a lot of questions. So we'll see. So please, um, I guess we're taking those on Discord. So please go into my channel and post those so that we have them ready for at the end. So yeah, so here we go. Um, like Nikki said, my name is Ashton and I just wanted to do a quick little run through of what we're going to be, what I'm going to be talking about here. Um, I'm just going to talk about my journey. I feel like maybe allowing people into my brain uh, to talk about graphic recording is one, but also just to kind of let everybody know of how I even landed in this spot in the first place. I find that's one of the uh, biggest questions that I get from people at events is how in the world did you end up here in the first place? So I wanted to speak about that. Um, we're going to be spending a significant part going through what I'm calling a graphic recording a visual case study where I have a TED talk that I'm breaking into pieces and I'm drawing it out uh, through video and then telling you about how I made decisions along the way of why I decided to capture why I did um, in those moments. And then I have a few tips at the end. And like I said, I wanted to kind of end with a Q&A. So do get those questions ready. So I have a confession. I feel like we're building this beautiful friendship together here today. And in friendship, we need to be honest with one another, right? And I do want to tell everybody that I do not work in tech. I, do, I don't know how to code. I don't never taken a class, like nothing, nothing. I am, I am the outsider. I really am like the outsider perspective in here because I do not work in technology at all. Um, and I guess I was invited to be here because of my experience, um, which I will be talking about a little bit. And as I was preparing for this talk today, I went through my, my numbers and, and thought to myself, like how many, um, how much of my experience is actually in, in technology? And when Nikki introduced me, she said 250 talks in technology and like that's so wrong. Like that's a really wrong statistic uh, because actually 73% of my professional experience has been within technology. And in more specifically, uh, these sort of aspects of technology, some internal tech events I've done, uh, the go-to, but then also um, DevOps and Android events, Swift events. I did an observability one last month, and I did a serverless day two weeks ago, two, last week, last Friday, I think it was. And I didn't know if cryptocurrency counted, but sure, let's put cryptocurrency in there as well. I've done a little bit in, in that field as well as technology. Sure, cool. Um, the rest uh, of the 27 or so percent uh, kind of is like any industry under the sun. Um, and one of the things that I love about doing this work is that I get to learn so much about so many different industries. And I was doing a fisheries conference last year and I was learning about the king crab and like all these interesting things. And uh, I get, I just get to like, kind of jump in and get a glimpse of what uh, these problems, all these really fascinating, crazy smart people are, are trying to solve. And um, yeah, it's just fascinating. So there's my, uh, it's like, thank you for letting me into your community and hanging out. At, and I, I have heard conversations. Uh, one of the things that I, I was telling somebody recently was, uh, I'll go to one tech event and they'll say, use this tool, it's amazing. And then I'll go to the next tech event and they'll be like, don't use that tool, it's no good. So uh, I don't know, like there's so many great things and so many uh, controversies in this community, which is always really fascinating to listen to. Um, and I really got started back in 2017. Uh, I started reaching out to different events all over the place and I happened to send the DevOps Days Toronto um, an email and just said like, hey, I do this thing, maybe it would interest you. Let me know if you wanna talk about it. And um, the organizing team was so sweet and they had never seen graphic recording done before, but they really took a chance on me. They said, sure, come fly, fly here, 
do your thing. We don't know what you're doing, but you should just come anyways because it sounds cool. And I was like, so grateful for them uh, because really it's, it's ripped my um, technology experience and, and connections have completely rippled out from that very first event back in 2017. So like, thank you to that beautiful community. Um, and I remember getting on the plane and it was the first event. Does anyone remember what planes are? Um, if anybody, or yeah, so I was on the plane and I had downloaded a couple of the DevOps Days talks from other events and I remember I was watching one and I like started having like a little panic attack because I was like, oh no, what have I gotten myself into? What, I have no idea what they're talking about. How in the world am I going to do this? And uh, yeah, so it was a very interesting experience. I'm, I'm so grateful to this day for that community for really helping me launch um, not just my experience in technology, but a lot of my business as a whole. So it's interesting to be on the other side of this, like the screen where people can like actually see my face because typically this is what people see when I'm graphic recording. They see uh, what I say, my good side and uh, not my face, hardly ever. So uh, I always find it funny when I'm at events and I'm in the lunch line and they go, oh, where do you work? And I'm like, oh, I'm actually, you know, the girl, she's, you know, drawn, drawn at the front. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's you because they don't know what I look like. So uh, that's typically what people see. So I thought I would share that with you because I feel like, like you might be missing out that you're not actually seeing like my good side. So there you go. So as our friendship is building here today, um, Nikki did say that I do live in Nova Scotia. And if you don't know where that is, that is highlighted on the, the Canada map right there in the, the turquoise color um, in the middle of nowhere. And I love it there and it's amazing. And this is my family. I have three small kids under seven. My oldest just turned seven and they all have nature names. I have a fern, I have an asif, and I have a salix, which is Latin for willow, like, like how nature can get. Um, and anybody who, um, you know, this is like the obligatory like Christmas photo. Anybody who has small kids will also appreciate this Christmas photo. Like I said, as our friendship is building here today, like I might as well be transparent, honest with you because like this was literally half an hour later, we wanted to try to get another photo by this, you know, tree at this like light festival thing. And my son didn't want to have anything to do with it. So my friend who was taking the picture, she's like, oh, we got to take it. We got to take it. So this was actually the picture that I sent out as a, my Christmas card because this is like reality. And like I said, anybody who has like, especially small kids will totally relate to trying to get the quote unquote perfect Christmas photo. So, so there you go. Um, he's still just as um, non-compliant as he is in this photo all the time. I don't know if it's a middle kid thing or what it is, but love and pieces, but he doesn't like to participate in things very often. So, journey. I started out in my early 20s working at a nonprofit. In working at that nonprofit, I learned about community development, which I totally got jazzed about and loved it. And in that as well, learned about facilitation, which I thought was amazing. Like. I thought I wanted to be a teacher at one point and then I learned about facilitation and I said like facilitation is amazing because you don't actually have to know anything like in teaching you might have to know things and you have to share that information but as a facilitator you get to know like whatever happens happens and you are asking questions from people and you're feeding back their answers to them so they can hear it from you. Um, you know, be like, well, you just told me this, like, I'm hearing what you're saying, and I'm putting it back on you. I'm not the one with the answers you are, and I'm just the conduit to make that happen. And I love facilitation so much. And um, I've been doing that for a little while and trying to figure out how I can, could do more of that. And I learned about graphic facilitation. And I didn't even know what that was. And I took a one day graphic fun fundamentals course, I guess this was back in 2013. And I was like in love. I felt like my creativity and my love for facilitation and, and group processes and all of that stuff was like just the perfect match. And it took me a few years after that just of practicing to really decide that I wanted to, you know, kind of give my all in, in this work. And it really, uh, it, you know, sharing more about me and 
our friendship here. Uh, if I put, if I just, when I decide to do something, I put like a hundred million percent into it. So I really dedicated the last um, like five, six years into being the best graphic recorder that I possibly could be. Um, I am a member of the IAF, International Association for Facilitators, and I am also a member of the IFVP, which is the International Forum for Visual Practitioners. So anybody who likes graphic recording or graphic facilitation, um, go and hang out and learn about the IFVP because they're a cool group of people and they're putting on a, a three-day virtual conference, but happening one day, one day, one day, June, July, and August, I think, or July, August, September, I can't remember. I should know this. Um, great community to be a part of, and I'm so grateful for both of them. So in, uh, I really believe that you can build a business doing absolutely anything. Um, and uh, I have just happened to choose it doing this, but if there's a problem to be solved in the world, there's a business to be built around it. And I guess I didn't really realize it until I started building this business that I've always had a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, but also within that, I've also had to change a lot of my mindset around what I believe in. And, you know, getting inside my head is not just, um, or getting inside my mind of a graphic recorder is not just about my processes, but it's also about your beliefs. And for me, believing that I could build a business, the believing that I could, um, like it says here, my skills are valuable and worthy of compensation. Uh, I had to change a lot of those beliefs because I, I had certain beliefs that, you know, living in a rural community or being a certain uh, age or whatever, or a level of um, uh, experience that I couldn't build a business and I couldn't be thriving and I couldn't have these things that I wanted in my life. And I spent a crazy amount of time uh, changing and rewriting beliefs. And I am a so like huge uh, self-development and self-improvement junkie. Um, and if anybody ever wants to talk about like mindset stuff, like hit me up because I am completely obsessed with that. I do want to comment, I forgot to mention that on my journey, you'll notice here that I never said that I went to art school. So uh, I took a little bit of a, a few, you know, day courses and uh, take, have taken some uh, online stuff and gone to some of the IFVP conferences, but like I've never been to art school. I've never really taken any like formal art classes, um, but as a facilitator, I think it using those skills have led me to uh, where I am today in terms of the graphic facilitation. And, uh, and I like that about myself that I didn't take any formal art education because I really do believe anybody can do this work. Um, and when I say work, it, it could be paid or not paid just for yourself or for others. And uh, so just because you've never gone to art school doesn't mean that you can't draw or you can't be awesome at helping communicate ideas. So I did want to mention that. So things that like fuel my love for this work is helping people see, uh, clear, build clarity around ideas and those kind of aha moments and uh, the excitement that I see in people when it really connects with them. And uh, it's obviously very good for my ego when people come up and say, you're so amazing. Um, even though it still always feels like really weird. Um, but yeah, just so grateful to be able to kind of create this life for myself that I can um, do something that I really love and spend my time doing that. And uh, my kids always have really great markers to play with, so bonus for them. Um, so I've been using a couple terminologies, so I wanted just to break them down from my perspective. Now, I would say uh, some people will disagree with, with um, people will certainly disagree with my terminology, um, but I will say from my perspective so that you understand is I, I will mostly talk about graphic recording, probably from here on out, I'll, I'll talk about graphic recording. Um, but every, like all the skills that you've learned today or any like sketch noting skills that you have um, prior to today, I, I call it like the umbrella, like they're the umbrella like skills that you're learning, right? And they're all awesome. And the thing is you can um, incorporate them in these three different ways. So for me, sketch noting is personal. It's typically small scale. Um, graphic recording is like what I do a lot of where it's like I'm at a conference, I'm doing it large scale and I'm capturing for the group. So in sketch noting, you might be capturing for yourself. So you're hearing it for yourself. So you might be capturing things that resonate with you personally, 
graphic recording, you're listening for the groups. You're trying to synthesize and listen and think about things as, um, as a collective, the collective information instead of thinking to yourself like, oh, well, this personally resonates with me. Um, and I think that's why sometimes it's awesome that I actually don't know a whole lot. Um, I'm like not embedded in any industry because it does help me have that like outsider's perspective because if I you know, worked in technology, but was doing graphic recording, I might think to myself like, oh, I got to remember this for later because this, you know, this relates to what I'm doing in my work. Um, but capturing that for the whole group might not make sense because it's a personal um, concept that you're, that you're taking in. And then graphic facilitation is more facilitated processes. Same thing, you're using the same sort of skill set, but just in a slightly different way where instead of, um, one person uh, capturing either uh, a talk or something that's sort of like one way. Uh, it's more of a collaborative idea where people in the room are capturing, or you know, the graphic facilitator is capturing conversation and brainstorms and questions and like the people in the room are creating what's happening. And typically when I'm working as like, when I have like my graphic facilitator hat on, I'm more embedded, I'm more engaged, I'm talking to people, I help create the agenda, I help you know, create the flow of the day, and what does that look like, and how can we make sure people feel heard and valued and appreciated, and um, that everyone's voice is heard, and all that jazz. So the skills that you're learning with sketch noting and like the stuff that Marlena just walked you through, like all that stuff is like amazingly, amazing for like foundational learning. And uh, it can just be applied in these different ways. So you could certainly take your sketch noting, scale it up and start drawing large in front of groups of people and call it graphic, graphic recording. Or if you're doing it in a meeting uh, where people are in the room, you can call it graphic facilitation or you can call it whatever you want. Um, these are just sort of the three main terms that, that come up. Um, but these, that's sort of my perspective on it. So I just wanted to kind of share that a little bit with you. Alrighty. So, um, this is my opinion that I think the, the number, I had to Google it the other day, that people make about 35,000 decisions a day, but a graphic recorder or sketch noter makes 100,000 decisions a day. Like, it doesn't really matter what the number is. It could be a million decisions a day. Um, but the big thing is we have to make so many decisions in the moment on the fly. And it's so important for us to listen in a way that we can make decisions quickly. Um, and I really hope that while we go through the case study, I'll kind of build a little bit of clarity around how I make those decisions in the moment. And what does that look like? Um, so this is a great uh, chart that Brandy Egerbeck, uh, she wrote, she's written a couple books, but this is from the Graphic Facilitators uh, Guidebook. And I called it my Bible for a long time because I would just carry it around for me to like build up my confidence. It's like, I can do this thing. Um, so you'll see here on the bottom that the listen, the thinking, and the but the drawing is really large. And a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on the drawing. And of course, it's super important and knowing how to make a mark is important. Um, but the listening and thinking are actually just as important. They're equal. And uh, it's just something to kind of take into consideration that, you know, just as much as you're honing your drawing skills, you have to hone your listening and thinking skills as well. And I'm hoping that uh, as we go through the case study, I'll be able to kind of reveal what some of that looks like, uh, because it's really hard to articulate, like, how do you, how do you learn how to listen better? How do you learn how to think and synthesize and process information easier? So, um, I just would highly encourage people to take that um, into consideration, that diagram. Uh, and really being a translator, either you're being a translator for yourself or you're being a translator for others, which is what I'm mainly doing. Um, I wrote a blog post back last year sometime if you wanna go check it out. But it's, uh, it's about how I, I guess I've always really been a bit of a translator. Um, I've always worked with kids and helping them translate their ideas or emotions. And I took sign language um, classes for six months. And people ask me, if you weren't a graphic recorder, what would you do? And I would totally be a sign language, sign language interpreter because I love that community. And I think it's an amazing way of uh, helping 
uh, communicate. And uh, yeah, I just, and as a facilitator, you're helping translate ideas from people and feeding it back in words. Um, and then as a graphic recorder, graphic facilitator, helping translate instead of words as a facilitator, you're translating back in pictures and images and ways to help build that clarity. So think of just another idea of thinking about this work um, as translation. All right, so we're gonna enter our case study here just in a second. Um, but one thing to always think about before you start any sketch noting, graphic recording, whatever process that you're going through, is you think about what the goal is at the end. So if this is just personal, like if you're doing a sketch noting and it's like personal just for you, then maybe the goal doesn't really matter because it's just for you. Um, but if your goal is to share it with others, then um, you need to kind of know that ahead of time. So are you capturing just for you? Are you capturing for a group of people? And then what are the people going to be doing with that after? Which in graphic facilitation uh, situations is extremely important because we don't know how that information is gonna be then dissected. Like, is it gonna be turning into, is that information then gonna be going uh, through uh, strategic planning? Like, how is that information gonna keep going? Like, how is it gonna live on? So if that information is gonna like, live on in some capacity, it's just a good way to think about how are you gonna capture that information so that it's gonna make sense to, you know, doesn't need to make sense to the person who wasn't there, or is it only gonna make sense to the people that were in the room? Um, are you sketch noting, but then sharing it with someone? Um, taking into consideration, uh, is it gonna be photographed if it's large? Or, uh, you know, cause if it's being photographed, you might not wanna use light colors. You might wanna stick to dark and you're lettering in, in dark colors like black. And, uh, you know, are you gonna be using other things like pastels to incorporate into it? Uh, that those don't photograph as well. So there's a few things you just want to take into consideration. Um, like what is the goal? What is what is going to what what are people going to be doing with this? If anything, after it's done, how is it going to be shared? Who's it for? What does that look like? Um, so I thought I would share that just before we get into the case study because knowing who your audience is for that image afterwards is really 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 important. Okay. So what we're gonna do here, I hope it works okay. So I chose a TED Talk um, to kind of dissect through this process. So the TED Talk is called The Skill of Self-Confidence by Dr. Ivan Joseph. And I chose this talk for many reasons. One, I was just searching, trying to find something that I thought would be good. And uh, I was looking for something around this time frame for this presentation today. I didn't really want a 20 minute one because I felt like it would be too long. And I didn't want something too short. Anyways, we settled with this at 13 minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, has a decent amount of views. It was posted back in 2012. Um, he has no slides. So I thought this would be a good choice because he doesn't actually have slides. Um, because sometimes, uh, we, me, you can uh, lean on the slides too much and, and end up kind of copying. So I was like, well, no slides, no slides to copy, just words. Um, and also he talks really fast. So I was thinking that would be a good challenge because capturing people who talk really fast is very challenging um, if you're used to doing any of this, this at all. So, um, so what is gonna happen? is this video, I have chunked it into six parts, six, I think it's six parts. And each part is about like two to three minutes long. And uh, after he's done talking, there might be like 20 seconds or so of me just like finishing drawing, so there'll be no words. Uh, typically I might do that after, if I need to catch up, I'll just wait to the end and then just like fill in the gaps and do color or whatever. Uh, but I figured because we're doing it in sections and I'm going to be talking about them after, I would just finish them up in the moment. So it's like the big, best case study that I could make given this um, opportunity. So the what I was warned about in uh, just a test is that his voice is actually very loud. Um, so 
you might want to get your finger on the uh, volume button and just turn him down while he's talking uh, because apparently his voice is much louder than I am speaking now. Um, so I just want to warn you of that. And also, um, I'm hoping that the video is not going to be too jumpy. So just bear with the technology part of it. We're just going to have to see how it goes. Um, so I'm going to play the first part. When that's over, I have a few slides that I'm going to be talking about how I made decisions in those as he was talking. Um, so I hope everybody's with me and I'm going to start the first video. You hear it? In my past life as a soccer coach, uh, once you win a national championship, everybody wants to come play for you. Really not true. Um, once you pay them $25,000 a year in scholarships, everybody wants to come play for you. And parents would always come to me and they'd say, okay, uh, my son or my daughter wants to come play at your university. What is it that we have to do? Um, you know, what are you looking for? And being the Socratic professor that I am, well, I said, well, what does your son or daughter do? What do they do really well that we'd be interested in? And typically their answers are, well, they've got great vision. They're really good. They can see the entire field. Or my daughter is the fastest player. There's nobody that can beat her. Or my son's got a great left foot or really, really great in the air and can head every ball. I'm like, yeah, not bad. But to be quite honest with you, those are the last things I'm looking for. The most important thing, self-confidence. Without that skill, and I use the word skill intentionally, without that skill, we are useless as a soccer player. Because when you lose sight or belief in yourself, we're done for. I use the definition of self-confidence to be the ability or the belief to believe in yourself to, to accomplish any task, no matter the odds, no matter the difficulty, no matter the adversity. The belief that you can accomplish it. Self-confidence. Some of you are saying, oh, great, I don't have it. I'm so shy. I'll, I'll never do good. I'm so... And you start to drag all the way down here. But I use the word skill because I believe it can be trained. And I'll show you a couple of ways in which we do. Hopefully I won't run out of time. I don't use any slides because my speech always goes here, here, or here. So we'll see which way we get to. So I was just taking the time to finalize it and I sped up the process. Um, so the video will stop here in a second. The thing about um, capturing digitally is that you have so much more flexibility to move things around and change where you don't have as much flexibility when you're doing it on paper. So I have been recently with doing more digital work have taken the opportunity to <laughs> lean on that flexibility or use it to my advantage. Um, so I'm going to Sorry. All right, so as I was capturing, you know, there was like little blips and I made mistakes and whatever, and I didn't really decide to edit those out because that's just part of the process, right? Um, so you just look at the red circle here for a second. Um, I had scholarship, I actually ended up taking it out. Uh, if I was doing it on paper that I would have like my white mailing labels and I would cover it over and write over it or whatever, I had to hide it. Um, but I felt like at the end of the day, the whole scholarship part really wasn't that core to what he was talking about. And, um, and it, if I knew what he was going to say, I might even like, I might not have even have captured what does your child like to do because it like to the whole meat of the presentation, I, you know, I don't really know how important that aspect of it was. Um, I highlighted actually in orange uh, to kind of give it a bit of a different depth and uh, you know, just give it a little bit more energy because I felt like that w the word actually was really important to, to the main talk. Uh, he said skill uh, and self-confidence obviously was, is the title of the talk, so it was a pretty important word, so I made it larger. I made someone who like smiling, who like looks like maybe they have confidence, and I made the skill part, you know, with a little like larger and highlighted a little bit more because of his belief that it is a skill. And, um, and I had like this like weird thing where I was like, how do you spell believe? And I was erasing it and I was like, I can't remember how to spell believe. I before E, I don't know. Uh, spelling is fine. I spell things wrong all the time. Uh, but you might've noticed that um, I felt like it, I really wanted to kind of capture what he said. So the ability to believe, to accomplish any task, 
you know, is it totally grammatically correct? No, not really. Um, but for this purpose, it's fine. Um, but I started to write a word and I didn't finish it. So I was like, oh, I'll write enough of the letters to then go back and fill it in. Um, and he started going on another story. Uh, so I was, so then I took the time right at that moment to fill it in, but sometimes I do that much later, um, even at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll go back and fill in the words. As long as you write enough of the letters, you know, the, the B-E-L, it'd be like, oh, right, he said believe, like, as long as you have enough of those letters to, like, trigger your brain to go back and say, oh, right, and fill it in, um, and he believed it can be trained as well. I already talked about her smiling face, so... That's sort of part one. So let's go on to part two here. We get to the easiest way to build self-confidence. There's no magic button. I can't say, hey, this plane is going down. Who can fly it? Put your hand up. I can. I'm confident. <laughs> <laughs> repetition, 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 right? What does Malcolm Gladwell call it? Uh, the 10,000 hour rule? There's no magic button. I recruited a goalie from Columbia, South America one year. Uh, big, tall, six foot three man. Uh, you know, he had hands like stone. I thought he was like flipper. Every time I throw him the ball down, down onto the ground, I was like, oh my God, we're in trouble. Simple solution, get to the wall, kick a ball against the wall and catch it. Kick the ball against the wall and catch it. His goal was 350 a day for eight months. He came back. His hands were calloused. The moisture on his hands were literally gone. He is now playing in Europe. Magic? No. Repetition, repetition, repetition. The problem is we expect to be self-confident, but we can't be unless the skill or the task we're doing is not novel, is not new to us. We want to be in a situation where we've created, we've had so much pressure in that, and what I mean because pressure builds diamonds, we want to be in a situation where, hey, I've done this a thousand times. I did my speech, and I practiced in front of the mirror. Da, 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 da. Hey, I'm sounding good. And then I read in front of my kids and my, and my wife. I was like, oh gosh, I got a little nervous. And then I get in front of Glenn Gould. Oh my goodness, I'm a little more nervous. By the time I get to the ACG, where 2,500 people, can't say anymore, right? 2,500 people, where 2,500 people are there, I won't have a single ounce of nervousness because of my ability to practice right? Over and over and over again. The problem with repetition is, well, how many of us bail after the first bit of failure? How many of us bail after the first bit of adversity? Edison was on that video, and depends who you ask, there's anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 tries to build that light bulb. 1,000 to 10,000. J.K. Rowling should be on that video. You know how many publishers she took her Harry Potter book to? I believe the number was 12 or 13. I don't, I'm pretty confident, but after two or three no's, I'd be like, dang it. After six or seven, I'm like, maybe not. Definitely after nine or 10, I'd be looking to be a soccer coach or something else beside an author, <laughs> right? I mean, 12 times somebody said no, but practice, 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 and do not accept failure. Maybe it shouldn't be repetition. Maybe the answer should be persistence because we all repeat something, but very few of us really will persist. So that's one way to build self-confidence. Get out there, do what you want to do and accept no, do not accept no. The other one is self- So it's just finishing up here. You can see I, I did decide to take Harry Potter out. Um, I felt like those stories were awesome, but to the core of what we're trying to capture here, so I decided to take those out. Um, cool. We get two. Yeah. All right, so um, first thing he said off right at, at the beginning, which I thought was important to capture, was the easiest way. Um, I didn't end up really jazzing the, the part up just because I didn't for whatever reason, but uh, I think, uh, you know, I could have made that a little bit larger or, or omitted it actually because, you know, in the grand scheme of things, is it most important? It's kind of hard to say. Um, Pressure. Uh, I added this after the fact. I cut, cut our video off, but I kind of was thinking in my mind after, like, what, could, what kind of like little visual icon could I use to kind of like show pressure? And I'm like, okay, well, you have arrows kind of pushing down and you've got little lines sh sort of showing that kind of pressure in between. Um, so it's not a, you know, a giant illustration, but just like a simple icon that kind of like shows that pressure. Um, I captured, whenever you like, you hear laughter, like a joke or something like, oh, I should capture that because it, people remember the jokes. So 
uh, I wrote I Can, I'm Confident. It might not make sense to people who didn't watch it now. That's the only thing. Um, and would I include it at the end, in, at the end of the day? Probably not. Um, it's just like a judgment call in the, in the moment. But uh, I decided to kind of capture it because I'm, I'm listening and I'm hearing like, oh, they laughed. I should capture that. Um, another thing is uh, just kind of the whole, I've done it a thousand times. And I think that that comment resonates with a lot of people. Um, and then what else? Oh, so then the whole persistence thing at the end. And I felt like, per, like the, you know, he really kind of leaned in on on that word he's like oh no it's actually persistence it's persistence and I felt like it was like maybe threading like it's like a thread I, I, I visualized it as like a thread so I was like oh I'll thread it through um the kind of the whole thing so you can kind of see well it's a repeat 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 but it's actually also persistence in that as well um yeah, so I think that's all I have to say about that. I did, I did pause. I don't know if you noticed, it's like awkward. I did pause after I wrote pressure, I think, because I was listening to hear like, what else is he saying? And he was like telling stories. And then I was thinking in my mind, like, are those stories important to capture? I don't know yet, let me just wait. So um, in the moment, sometimes it's like waiting, you have to kind of give yourself permission to wait that you're not always writing something down. Um, Cause then it just allows you to kind of take a minute listen, gather your thoughts of, of what you're hearing, you know, weigh the pros and cons of what you're capturing. Um, so I just wanted to point that out as well. All right, part three. Get out there, do what you want to do and accept no, do not accept no. The other one is self-talk. We all have a self-talk tape that plays in our head. Anybody go shopping and put on a pair of pants this week? If you're a woman, the first thing that always comes, damn, I look fat in these pants. <laughs> And if you're a man, it's the opposite. Oh God, I have no muscle, I'm so flabby, right? We all have this tape that plays in our head. As a student, if they asked me the question, it was like, oh gee, please, don't, please professor, don't pick me. I don't know the answer, I don't pick, I look down, right? If you're in the, when I, let me tell you something, and the VP of business admin is here, so I shouldn't repeat this, but when they hired me as an athletic director, I sat in an architect's meeting, and I am as about as dumb as a post when it comes to anything to do with numbers and angles. And they're like, the uh, fundibulator valve of the uh, architectural, they're, they're, uh, what do you think, uh, Dr. Joseph? Uh, let me look into that for you and get back to you. <laughs> right? I was sitting there, God, God, don't, please don't ask me. Please don't ask me. We all have this negative self-talk that goes in our head. Guess what? There's enough people that are telling us we can't do it, that we're not good enough. Why do we want to tell ourselves that? We know for a fact that thoughts influence actions. We saw it there with the, um, with the video Sheldon, Dr. Levy showed, right? We know that our thoughts influence actions. Why do we want to say that negative self-talk to ourselves? We need to get our own self-affirmations. Muhammad Ali, what was his self-affirmation? I am the greatest. Who else is gonna tell you? There need to be quiet moments in your bedroom, quiet moments when you're brushing your teeth, that we need to reaffirm, I am the captain of my ship and the master of my fate. That is my affirmation. I came from a school of 1,000 people. I lived in a town of 1,000 people for 15 years. There's no reason that I should be in charge of an athletic department building Maple Leaf Gardens. But I am the captain of my ship and the master of my fate. If I don't say it, if I don't believe it, no one else will. How do you build self-confidence? Let's let this play for a minute. Oh, 10 seconds. Get out there. Alrighty. So 
So we said right in the beginning about that sort of negative self-talk. So I, I thought, okay, well, it's a good opportunity. I, drawing people in, in your sketch notes, I feel like is really important. It was great for Marlena to walk us through some examples of drawing different people. Um, but I, I've never actually drawn a little person with like a speech bubble in his head before. It just sort of came to me in the moment. And I was like, that's kind of fun idea. And usually I do like the exploding head, which can be a little off-putting for people with, you know, thoughts coming out. But um, I, I just, you know, you, you just think of things in the moment. So I, I thought of that and, and thought, okay, well, I could, you know, make him looking sad. He's like, oh, you know, not, not feeling so good. Um, and then uh, as I was doing that, I was listening to, he said, there's enough people out there telling you you're not good enough. So I sort of like banked that in my brain. If I was doing this in person, I might have a sticky note close by and like jot something down super fast and just stick it and then come back to it. Um, and sometimes I'll do that and make a sticky you note and, and come back and then I'll like assess after, you know, um, I'm done or as, as something else is going on, I'll assess if I actually should put that sticky you note on. Um, but it's like I had a little bit of a mental sticky you note for that one. And, um, and it's something I could easily remember because it resonated with me. So like there's enough people out there telling you're not good enough. So uh, it was easy for me to remember. But as I had that sort of bang to my brain, I was also listening to what he was saying. And he told the Muhammad Ali and I'm like, eh, I don't think I can, I don't need to capture that, um, the story. Uh, and then he said, I'm the captain of my ship. And, uh, and he said it, the first time he said it, I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting, but I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait on that one. And then I think he said it like three times, at least twice. And uh, I was like, okay, that's important. You know, when someone says something more than once, especially in a short amount of time, it's probably important to capture. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a good visual metaphor, even though trying to draw a boat wasn't coming to me in the moment. So I, uh, I didn't get the whole quote. Uh, I think it's, uh, I'm the captain of my ship and master of my something. Um, which I can't remember now, but uh, I, I thought that was like capturing part of it was, was okay. Um, and then I kind of put out uh, some lines for like the self-affirmation part, commented on that. And uh, for anybody who remembers cassette tapes, there's a little like drawn cassette tape for you as well. And then I just like highlighted some things, right? Like you're not good enough is like the core of that message. So, um, you know, I probably could have highlighted enough people um, or, or even there is enough people highlighted that as well, because those like, that's the, the meat of it. Um, and then the thoughts and fluid actions, I thought like drawing a little speech bubble around that would be cool. And then just adding a few lines and color and back color would just sort of bring it all together. Um, but yeah, that sort of was my thought process in the middle of that one. So let's go on to number four. Get away from the people who will tear you down. There's enough of that. Muhammad Ali, I am the greatest. There is no one better than me. It's a difference between hubris and ego and false pride. It's just reminding yourself in quiet, silent moments. I put it down on a list. It's right beside my mirror, right? About all the things that make me who I am because I make enough mistakes and the newspapers will recognize it and people around me will recognize it and they'll tear me down. And pretty soon I'll begin to believe it. There was a time when my confidence was really low. There was a time when I took this job, when I came from Iowa, I don't know if I could do it. I had to bring out my self-confidence letter, a letter I wrote to myself when I was feeling good. Ivan, congratulations on getting your PhD before 40. Congrat I am 40, under. <laughs> congratulations on winning a national championship. Good job on raising three good kids and marrying the right woman. I wrote a letter to myself. It was my own brag sheet, my own letter about the things I was proud of. Because there are moments, and we'll all experience them in our career, in our life, in our job hunting, in our relationships, when we are not feeling good about who and what and where we are. And I had to bring out that letter and read it time and time again for a period of about two weeks to weather me through that storm. It was important. Stop the self-talk, the negative self-talk. If you'll watch, you'll see some athletes, they'll have a little bandage or a little um, brand around them. Uh, Lance Armstrong's a perfect one. What's his self-affirmation? Live strong isn't a brand. It was to remind him of who he was. Live strong. Then it came a brand. He would move that from one arm to the next arm when doubt 
and fear came into his mind. Live strong. Put it on there. Let's go. We'll all have it. Replace it. Two ways to build self-confidence. Worried about my time, I'm going to tell you of one way that you can build self-confidence in others. We are coaches or educators. I'll just let this finish up. Alrighty. So, um, so the first thing he said was get away from the people who will tear you down. So I felt in the moment, I was like, okay, get away is really important. And then using a little bit of uh, fun lettering kind of made the down look like it's going down. And I thought to myself in the moment, like, what could I draw that um, would show someone getting away from someone? And I was like, you know, this is where that decision making in the moment comes in, right? And I'm thinking, okay, well, like, how would I do that? And I'm like, oh, well, what greater way of getting away is like jumping off a cliff with a parachute. So uh, just whipped that little, you know, I knew how to draw a little cliff. I've drawn it many times. So I was like, oh, I'll just throw a cliff in there and do a little just, you know, kind of like glorified stick person with a little parachute done. Um, it's really showing that there's no more than no other way to, or no larger grandiose way of getting away from someone than like literally jumping off a cliff. So get away. And as he was talking, he was telling a story about the letter and, and his, you know, all the things he wrote in it. And I was listening to that, um, you know, but you know, just sort of capturing it in my mind, like, okay, is this going to be important to, to capture? But then he said confidence letter and brag sheet. And I was like, ding, ding, there we go. Those are the two things to capture next, to write those things, do a little envelope, little, little letter, add some color, there you go. And then as he was telling the story about Lance Strong, I was listening to it and be like, hmm, I wonder, you know, how is this unfolding? How is this unfolding? And then um, the Live Strong brace, I was like, ding, you know, so a visual cue to help people remember later on that uh, the story about moving it from one arm to another. Um, so that was it as well. My little parachute guy, Live Strong. All right, we're gonna go on to the next one. We are educators, we are teachers, we are people who will create value in the world. And in doing that, we are critical by the nature of what we do. I am a, I am a coach. I want you to score a goal. Ball went over high. Dang it, the ball went high. Thank you, coach, I know that. <laughs> Feedback tells me that. So what do we do? I need you to put your elbow or here. I need you to put your knee over the ball. I need to follow through. Boom, land, great. Notice I never made it as a professional. <laughs> What can we do? We fix mistakes. When I'm fixing that mistake, Johnny, this is terrible. You need to bend your knee. You need to do this, this. What have I done to Johnny's self-confidence? Bend your knee. Think of this. Think of this. Next thing you know, Johnny's crushed. Ignore what Johnny does wrong and find Bob or Sally or Frida over here. Great goal, Frida. I loved how you kept your knee low. You followed through and you landed like this. Great job. Johnny, oh, huh? great. Johnny's not demoralized. His confidence isn't shot. And what I've done is I've built up Frida's. Imagine how we could change the way we parented kids instead of get that glass off the counter. What's wrong with you? <laughs> if we catch them while they're good. Great job. Great job. Thank you, Alice, for taking your glass to the counter. It sounds simple, but we forget about it. Or as educators, or somebody as a team, if we manage to praise the positive behavior that we wanted to reinforce. We forget it. It sounds so simple. Catch them when they're good. We forget it. It's simple. Here's what they did. There was a study in Kansas that did this. They did video, and we all do video, and we showed the video of them doing the run of the play. Uh, this goal happened because the basket wasn't protected. We didn't rotate here right. We needed to do this and then to cover the slot. And if that's the baseline, improvement of the Kansas State team went like this. Then they said they ignored all of that, and they just showed them the times they did it right. The times they did it perfect, that presented no goals, spoke to the same points, improvement went like that. It changed and revolutionized the way we as coaches interact with our student athletes. We can apply that to the business world, we can apply that to our student group works, we can apply that to our management teams easily. Catch them when they're good. Last and certainly not least, my son is really good at just because of time, I'm just going to to that. 
to the talking about it. So, so he sort of said in the beginning, like how, so next, like how can you build confidence in others? And I'm like, okay, that's like a bit of a title. It's like larger, it's, you know, he's going to be talking about this next. So capturing that you in others, I felt like in the moment were really important. Those, those sort of three words. Um, and as I'm kind of listening, I'm hearing him tell a story about, you know, Johnny and feeling bad and Greta or whatever her name was, like, you know, I'm listening and I'm trying to decipher, like, are those stories important or like, what's the final um, message at the end? So he said a few things like, great, great goal, build up, praise positive change. And then he said a couple of times, catch them while they're good. Um, I actually have a hard time with, um, kids being good so that was like a personal thing that kind of came up for me when I heard it because I was like ooh, I don't want to write that because kids aren't good or bad like it's weird uh because I have a background and like actually went to school for early child education so like kid stuff is like like I hear that stuff in a different way um so anyways but I have to kind of put that aside and capture it anyways because that's what he said um you know wanted to kind of capture someone who looks good uh, or looks good looks happy and you know like praising that positive behavior uh and i decided to kind of build put those in speech bubbles so it's not saying like you need to say this it's like the speech bubbles are representing that that's something that you could say drawing someone good or i keep saying drawing someone good so drawing someone who is looking happy all right this is our final part certainly not least my son is really good at this Self-confident people interpret feedback the way they choose to. I asked my son, who is by the far terrible, terrible athlete, gets it from his dad. <laughs> the games, they win five nothing. How's the game? Oh, great, I, I scored three goals, I got two assists. I'm like, I did not see him touch the puck. But he has his own perception of how he did. <laughs> I love it, right? I'm, the, I'm that guy. I'm like, I remember when I was taking my, there's, I, when I met my wife, it was in the comments. Ah, uh, Polly, I'd like to, would you like to go to the movies? Ladies, tickle, tickle, tickle. <laughs> and she goes, uh, she goes, um, no. I, 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 I ask her again, because I think that she just hasn't seen me in the right light. Maybe that's not the wrong shirt on, right? Because I'm interpreting that the way I want to interpret it. Finally, I asked her out again. She, she gives me this one comment, right? Or, or she sent it through her friend, because that's the way you did it back then. Uh, he would not, she wouldn't date you unless it was the last person on Earth that hell was freezing over. There was a small chance we had to save the planet Earth. Some people's like, there's no chance. I'm like, you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> right? Because that's how I'm going to interpret it. If I could give you one thing to take from this, it is no one will believe in you unless you do. Listen to the words of that video. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes. We're supposed to be different, folks. And when people look at us, believe in yourself. Thank you. All right, for, for time, I'm just... Certainly not least forward because I like ran out of time for questions. Okay, so feedback. I was like, oh, visual vocabulary. I didn't even really mention that yet, but you know, you, you're building, you build a visual vocabulary and you think when you hear something, you're like, oh, I'm gonna capture that image goes with that idea. So when I hear the words like feedback, I think like a megaphone or, or something like that. So, uh, you know, or you could do like a feedback loop. I've done that at lots of tech events. Um, or, you know, you could have two people kind of, you know, in a, in a loop around it. Anyways, that's the decision I made in the moment. Um, and, you know, he started with the interpret feedback the way that you choose. And I felt like that was sort of like a core, core idea. So I kind of decided to put it in a, in, you know, a different color, make it a little bit more fun. And uh, there at the end, I skipped forward. But um, he said your own perception and, you know, what's a, what's a visual that could go with perception? Oh, an eye. There you go. I have um, fire trucks in the background, so sorry about that if you can hear it. Um, and then no one will believe in you unless you do. And I felt like that was really a core message as well. So, um, oh my gosh, time. Okay, so uh, so yeah, and then I just jazzed it up with like, you know, interpreting, uh, kind of put these like little kind of data lines around uh, the interpret part. And, um, you know, just to kind of make it, you know, give it a bit of a different visual element. Than just like a basic box 
and uh, and then put a speech bubble around it as well. So this was the final image. So I didn't show this part. Um, I and I should have prefaced this that I always start with you know ninety five percent of the time I know what the title is going to be. So I do that ahead of time, and I started. I chose my color palette ahead of time as well. I said. I'm gonna do like a red and orange kind of yellowy colors. And uh, my rule of thumb when I'm in a person uh, doing work is uh, whatever I can fit in my fingers. So one, two, three, four. Um, and usually my gray is the extra I'll stick it in my pocket. Um, so a good rule of thumb for choosing color is like three main colors and a black. Uh, so I kind of follow that rule. I, I can do a little bit um, of extra colors when I'm doing digital. So, but I, I kind of kept with the, the same color palette. So you see here, I just kind of, I put the pieces in, I looped it together, there you go. Um, this is a different version. I took out all the elements that I don't think were like to the core message. So if you look at this version, which is what you just saw, and this version, you'll see that things, some things have disappeared. So I intentionally went in and took away the extra things that I thought were, um, I'm gonna say like less important, but if you are looking for like the core of it, these are the things. It's a skill, it can be trained. Negative self-talk, you need self-affirmations. Get away from people who tear you down. You can do, you can build self-confidence in others. Oh, um, it's pers about persistence and repeating and I've done it a thousand times and how you interpret that feedback, boom. So you can look at this, you know, in this one's fine too. Um, and I, I never, you know, go back and, and take a talk and take half of it, of it out. I just thought it would be an interesting ex experiment to kind of put forward on here. And, um, yeah, so so that's that. So I hope that kind of visual case study was helpful. Um, you know, uh, I did just mention about visual vocabulary. You have to think like, um, if someone's saying something like, this takes this much time, and you think in your mind like, oh, time, I could draw a clock, and then you draw the clock. Um, I kind of, you like, you have like a database in your mind. Like when you're learning a new language, I call it a visual language, you're learning a language. So I know how to draw, like right off the top of my head, I know how to draw like five or six different versions of clock or time, like an hourglass or like an alarm clock, like in kind of an old school alarm clock or a digital alarm clock or like a clock like that. Like you're, you're build up your visual vocabulary so that you're not, you don't have to think like, when you have to make all those decisions in the moment, you can't be think. You can't just stop and think for a moment. Like, what am I going to draw? You just have to go, boom, translate. Oh, clock. Oh, I'll draw this, right? Um, so, just a few tips here at the end before we get a question. So, you really have to embrace your own style, whatever that looks like for you. Uh, when I started doing this work, I was crazy intimidated by all the amazing people out there who. Uh, their work just looked incredible. And um, I had to really intentionally tell myself, like, stop it, Ashton, like, and, and stop comparing yourself to other people's styles. Everyone's is going to look different, and that's okay. They should look all different. Um, and the way that I captured this here, you would capture it, and it would look completely different, and you might capture different things, and that's cool. I've captured the same talk a couple different times, and they always look completely different, so you just never really know. Just a quick tip about lettering, um, not like a lettering master by any means, but one thing that's really kind of helped me that I thought I would share is um, being consistent. So if, especially if you're gonna be sharing something, so the difference between the top line and the bottom line is the consistency in the lettering. So I've had to be really diligent and like almost feel like you're going back to elementary school by like practicing like, how am I gonna write an E? And I have to write that E the same every single time. Another tip about lettering is every time you make a mark, you pick up the pen. And it takes a little bit of time to kind of rewire your brain, but it will help you make crisper lines. But even just like choose the letters that you have more difficulty, like R's and G's and stuff like that can be tricky. S is like, I still struggle with S. S, S is the most difficult uh, letter to draw. But you know, the, the two E's there at the bottom, they look completely different. And, it just makes it uh, look a little bit more messy than the top one. It's just like really clean and crisp. Um, so just a tip. I just wanted to kind of share this comparison. Um, this is a, the one in the top was one that I did back in 2016. And the one in the bottom was one that I did back last November at an event. And you can see the difference um, of my growth, right? So just because you might not feel super great about what you're completing right now or what you're drawing or sketch noting or whatever right now, uh, you have so much more opportunity to grow. And, you know, this was hundreds and hundreds 
of graphic recordings later, I got to a you know more defined style and and more imagery and things like that. And um, the one at the top took me three hours to complete, and the one in the bottom took me forty minutes. So you just it's like like that guy was talking about self confidence, like practice, 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 and you'll get good. I always say like, you'd be good as me. You would. I promise you, you would be as good if you spent the last number of your years only doing this work. Um, just a peek into my kit. I wrote a blog post if you want to go check it out. I'm not going to have time to talk about it. Um, but I always have lots of things on hand in case uh, we need to have anything. And uh, the last thing I wanted to leave with, which I love that Bob Ross came up a couple of times during this conference, is what I always say when I'm doing this work. Uh, there's happy little accidents. There's like a happy little accident in every single graphic recording that I do because you just never know what's going to happen. And you might think in your mind like, oh, oh no, they went into a different direction and they completely changed. Oh darn, what am I going to do next? And it always works out. So please embrace those like what you might perceive in the moment as a mishap um, and just perceive everything as a happy accident. So that is it. Thank you.